Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start uh, straight away. Um, I'm going to start with why we are uh, actually having this class. Um, there are lots of banned books and we just get to uh, hear about them. You know, once in a while we catch a news story, so-and-so book is banned. And uh, the reasons are so varied and sometimes so beyond our, our comprehension that we wonder why. And some of these books that we've actually read many times and loved in our childhood, and suddenly we find that they are banned. Uh, Huckleberry Finn, for example. And uh, uh, the other day I was reading that... Uh, uh, stories by Dr. Seuss have been banned, some of them. Charlotte's Web was banned. So, um, uh, so one wonders why, why they are banned and what leads to uh, book banning. Now, The Catcher in the Rye is one of the most famous examples, uh, 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 you know, in modern times of a banned book. But as was just pointed out to you, uh, its readership has never diminished. Uh, people continue to read it generation after generation. Uh, their perspectives might change. Uh, their uh, viewpoints about the book may change, but they still continue to read it. And they still, many, many people still love it. So I uh, have um, uh, here a little passage that I found. Uh, on the all-knowing internet, uh, which tells us a little about book banning. Book banning, the most widespread form of censorship, occurs when private individuals, government officials, or organizations remove books from libraries, school reading lists, or bookstore shelves because they object to their content, ideas, or themes. We call them the moral police now uh, because everyone seems to have an opinion about everything. And according to his or her uh, personal opinion or an organization's opinion, uh, they, will, they will ban books. Those advocating a ban complain typically that the book in question contains graphic violence. Well, yes, many books do contain graphic violence, uh, expresses disrespect for parents and family. Well, yes, all that is true. Is sexually uh, explicit, exalts evil, lacks literary merit, is unsuitable for a particular age group or includes offensive language. Okay? Um. In, uh, okay, then this person goes on to say that book banning is the most widespread form of censorship in the United States, with children's literature being the primary target. Advocates for banning a book or certain books fear that children will be swayed by its contents which they regard as potentially dangerous. They commonly fear that these publications will present ideas, raise questions, and incite critical inquiry among children that parents, political groups, or religious organizations are not ready to address or they find inappropriate. One of the most famous books uh, one of the first books to be ever banned was Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence, followed by Ulysses by James Joyce. And then there's a whole list of uh, banned books. Uh, another famous book and well-known, well-read book is Huckleberry Finn and uh, Catcher, The Catcher in the Rye, which was... Uh, originally written for adults, but became um, a, a byword with teenagers of the time. Then 
you know, there was a ban called upon it because they felt that people felt that it was not suitable for teenagers, although the book is about a teenager who's frustrated with life and because he cannot understand. And this word occurs again and again in the book. He cannot understand the phoniness of adults. So in a way, this was uh, uh, a, a, a telling um, criticism, indictment of the way adults uh, <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Of the of the way adults conducted themselves uh, in the world, and when looked at from the point of view of a teenager, who's on who's at that stage, who's 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 literally uh, teetering at the edge of losing his innocence and thereby becoming an adult, how he looks at 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 the adults. So you can understand why parents and other groups might want to ban the book. Okay, but let's first see what the book is about. It's written by J.D. Salinger and a little more about him in a bit. Well, here's J.D. Salinger. Okay. Um, and this is good-looking, huh? handsome man, right? Uh, and uh, he he recently uh, died at the age of 91. And I think the reason for his long life could perhaps have been uh, he was a recluse. Soon after the publication of Catcher in the Rye, he became a recluse. He'd read a pretty, led a pretty controversial life before that. But soon after the publication of the book and all the unwanted publicity that he received from it, he decided to let go of people and lived mostly on his own. Do you think... That might contribute to the fact that he led a long life. He didn't have to interact with people. Well, he would have been a lot like Holden Caulfield, uh, who's the protagonist of The Catcher in the Rye, who also has, you know, uh, these introverted tendencies and doesn't want to mingle with people because he think all, all people, everybody's a fraud. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, these allergies are going to destroy me one day. And J.D. Salinger, by the way, has admitted that part of the novel was autobiographical. Okay? The Catcher in the Rye is an American novel published in 1951 and, as Ali told you, deals with adolescent angst and alienation. Uh, its protagonist, Holden Caulfield, has become an icon for teenage rebellion and is one of the best-known characters of modern literature, except that now there has been a change of heart amongst today's teenagers, and they feel that Holden Caulfield, with all the privileges had he, that he had, uh, could have been uh, could have made something of his life um, instead of just being a frustrated teenager and 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 a whiny person is what they call him. He whines, he complains, he's and he, he feels he's entitled, and um, uh, really get a life is what today's teenagers apparently are saying about the protagonist of this novel. But for the longest time, he was the prototype of uh, all that teenagers, both boys and girls, suffer when they are growing up. Growing pains, we used to call them. I remember. Okay, <clears throat> the novel has been translated uh, widely and about uh, 1 million copies are sold every year. It features on many prestigious lists of the most famous books of the 20th century. In 2000, 
2003, it was featured at number 15 on the BBC's survey, The Big Read. Okay, so Jerome David Salinger was born on January 1st, 1919 in Manhattan, New York and died on January 27th, 2010 in Cornish, New Hampshire at the age of 91. <laughs> of natural causes. His son, Matt Salinger, is an actor and his daughter, Margaret Salinger, is a writer. So what briefly is the, is the novel about? It details only two days in the life of Holden, who is a 16-year-old and who has been expelled from college prep school for the second time. This is the second school that he has been expelled from. Why? Because of his consistently bad grades. Okay, he's confused, he's disillusioned, and he rails against the phoniness of the adult world. At the end of the book, he's exhausted, emotionally unstable, finds himself in some kind of a rehab center where he's being treated for his psychological problems. But at the, but at the end, um, he holds out a, a ray of hope for the readers by saying that in the fall, he will be going to a new school. So we just have to imagine whether he's going to go, whether he's going to be expelled from this third school also, or whether he's going to get a grip on himself. Now, the story is told uh, in, in, in flashback. Okay, it starts with him getting expelled, right? And he tells, it's written in the first person. So he tells his readers, uh, he tells his readers that uh, uh, that 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 he's you know that he's been expelled because of his bad grades. This is the second time, and that he's supposed to be due back home on Wednesday. And his parents don't know yet that he's been expelled. The letter may reach them either before he does or when he does. But his bags are packed. And he's ready to be sent home at the end of the term. What he does is, now he belongs to a privileged home. Okay. His parents, his folks are upwardly mobile people. Right. And uh, he has plenty of money. There's no dearth of pocket money here in this boarding school that he is in. So, um <clears throat> After after some incidents, uh, an interaction with his uh, uh, with his roommate and 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 the boy who's uh, in the next room, uh, 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 he he decides that he's going to uh, he's just going to leave that same night. He's just going to walk out of the school, right, uh, with his trunk and catch a catch a uh, train to New York. So the setting of the of the novel is 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 um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, you know New York, and uh, uh, he uh, he he decides that's what he's going to do, and he counts his money and he says, "Oh well, I have enough money for three or four days in New York, and that's what I'm going to do." So he just walks out of the uh, of the school. And uh, there's a lot of talking to himself. Now, in this talking to himself, we get to know the story, his backstory, right? And his backstory is uh, that he has a brother who is a brilliant writer, but has gone to Hollywood to uh, write screenplays. And according to Holden, now the entire book is written from the point of view of the of Holden. According to Holden, uh, his brother was his. He calls him J, uh, D, DJ or JD or I think the same initials as as Salinger, and as he's a brilliant brilliant writer until he went to Hollywood and prostituted himself. 
what does what do you think i think that word itself in 1951 would have been enough to ban the book but what does he mean by that he means that before he went to hollywood he was writing what was in his heart what he, what what he what he wanted to write about now he's writing the screenplays or stories of movies so he's writing for someone else and getting paid for it so you can do the math here you can add up two and two right so that's what he means when he uses that term and uh, but but he is he loves his brother he has a younger sister who will who does play an important part at the end of the book she's 10 years old her name is phoebe but what we are told uh, is that uh, he had a brother who died fell ill and died and they were very good friends holden and this dead brother uh, of his okay and that has probably well holden was pretty normal before this uh, tragedy but it is this tragedy that makes him uh, th that gives him he becomes a, he has ptsd from 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 this from this tragedy and of watching his his brother uh, fall ill and die and in fact he has to be taken uh, uh, to a, to a nursing home he has a, he has a nervous breakdown and does not even get to attend this young boy's funeral so after that he says like you know i've been messed up and i've been seeing the world from a different point of view and i think that adults are just the worst people uh, in the world, the only person uh, that he is still fond of and is uh, not disillusioned about is his 10-year-old sister. So all this we are told uh, in flashback. Then we are told about his uh, the girls that he went out with, the girls that he liked, right, who weren't necessarily the girls that he went out with. And uh, he finds himself in New York and he has a couple of pretty unsavory adventures there. Okay. But interspersed with, uh, interspersed with, with, with two or three uh, fairly normal uh, episodes like his encounter in Grand Central Station with two nuns who are waiting for a uh, bus, uh, for a train and they are they are collecting money for a cause and he generously uh, gives them much more money than he expected then offers to uh, offers to uh, you know carry their bags for them so i think what the writer is trying to tell us here is that you know he's not all uh, all messed up okay so um <clears throat> Right. And again, just for a minute, we come back to why the book was banned. Well, it does have uh, details of him uh, drinking, uh, um, smoking, uh, having an uh, uh, an encounter with with uh, with two uh, uh, street walkers. But uh, Although uh, the, uh, the the writer is at pains to tell us that uh, that he uh, that nothing happens, okay. Yet it's not a it's not a great encounter uh, because uh, they cheat him of of you know his money and uh, their uh, their handler comes and beats him up that kind of thing then he, he calls up and then he has a very very unsavory uh, uh, experience with another person so uh, this is 1951 remember so he had uh, an art teacher uh, in school who he was very fond of and he knows he lives in and in fact that teacher 
and uh, that teacher and his wife became good friends with his parents too. So they at one time were meeting socially too. Okay, and uh, he calls him up and now this is now the probably the night of the second day that he's been just walking around in, in uh, uh, New York and he calls him up and he says, can I come and spend the night there because he doesn't want to go home, right? It's not yet Wednesday and Wednesday is the day he's due back home. So he goes there. They have a very pleasant evening in which the teacher drinks a lot, gives Holden a lot of advice and Holden makes up a bed for him on the on the couch and Holden falls asleep and gets up in the middle of the night and uh, finds that his, his teacher is 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 pushing the hair back from his uh, forehead okay now we are left in absolute doubt as to as to what the teacher meant right but it's enough to scare Holden and he just gets up from there and leaves. So there are many theories. It could have been an innocent gesture. It could have been something else, right? So we, we don't really know what Salinger meant except to tell us that teenagers feel unsafe. In situations or in places where they should be feeling safe. So basically, you're not safe anywhere. And there are a hundred ways in which you can lose your innocence. So it's, uh, it's not for nothing that the book became famous. It's not for nothing that the book became popular because we have another incident. Uh, there is a girl who never actually enters the story. We just hear about her from, from Holden and uh, she is, uh, uh, you know, she has a stepfather. I, you know, I don't even need to tell you the rest of it. So we are not given any details except when Holden is sitting with her and outside her house and the stepfather calls her in, right? Uh, she ignores him and but then Holden sees that there are tears in her eyes and, and you know, she's trying to wipe away her tears and she has this kind of stricken look on her face and that's enough to tell him, you know, something that doesn't even need to be uh, spelled out. So that's why his total uh, anguish about the adult world, where he and 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 others like him can never feel uh, safe. Okay. Now the beginning of this uh, book. Harks back to a novel written in the 19th century by a writer called Charles Dickens. I'm sure that you've all read some of his books or are familiar uh, with, with him. Um, so Holden Caulfield begins his uh, novel by writing, if you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. Okay, so these first words uh, tell us that this is not going to be an ordinary novel. And the narrator warns us that if you want a, a, a neat and clean story of a boy who was born 
and finds happiness at the end of the book like David Copperfield did after all the suffering that he went through as a child and of all his travails as a young man, right? So if this is not going to be that kind of a memoir. This is not going to be that kind of a book. When a book is written in first person, the readers have to presume that uh, that that the story the narrator is going to tell is a true one. Okay, so so and that's what Holden is trying to tell us that you know he's a real person. Now we know that many fictional characters are based on real people, and and very often they are based on the writer himself. And books are based on the experiences of a writer. Okay. And in an interview, Salinger admitted that The Catcher in the Rye was semi-autobiographical. Right. So, so that basically is, is what the book ab is about till the last uh, few pages of the, of the novel. Just a minute, huh? let me, yeah, oops. Okay, I'm back with my, right. So, um, before I go to those last few pages, which I told you offer us some kind of a hope, let's see uh, what the meaning of the title is does anybody has anybody ever thought about the title of this book? It, okay, the the meaning of the title it's it's a reference to coming through the rye, a Robert Burns poem, and a symbol for Holden's longing to preserve the innocent of innocence of childhood. He overhears a boy singing, if a body catch a body coming through the rye. But the actual line is, if a body meet a body coming through the rye. Holden misinterprets and thinks that he would be a catcher who would prevent children from falling into adulthood. Let me explain. So Robert Burns wrote a poem called Coming Through the Rye. Okay, Robert Burns was a famous uh, um, uh, Scottish poet, right? And uh, the poem itself has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the way uh, 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 Holden Caulfield interprets it. Okay, and that's why, in a way, the title itself is is messed up, <laughs> right? Because it's based on a misinterpretation by the protagonist of a poem that was written uh, long ago and had a completely different meaning from the one that Holden puts into it First of all, misunderstanding the words. And secondly, using his imagination to supply the rest. Okay, let me read out the original poem to you. Coming through the rye, poor body. Coming through the rye. She dragged her petticoat coming through the rye. Oh, Jenny's a sweet, poor body. Jenny's seldom dry. She dragged her petticoat coming through the rye. Rye refers to rye fields. Gin a body, meet a body. This is now Scottish that we are reading here. Uh, gin is if. So gin a body, meet a body coming through the rye. So if a body, meet a body coming through the rye. Again, I'll use the English translation. If a body, kiss a body. Need a body cry? Oh, Jenny's a sweet, poor body. Jenny's seldom dry. She dragged her petticoat coming through the rye. 
If a body meet a body coming through the right, if a body kiss a body, need the world can. Coming through the glen, sorry. Gain a body, meet a body coming through the glen. Uh, gain a body, kiss a body, need the world can. So you see, the meaning is completely different. It refers to uh, the meeting of a boy and girl in the rye fields and the boy stealing a kiss from the uh, a girl, right? And the poet asking his readers, does the world have to know that the boy stole a kiss from her? Okay. Of course, there are much deeper interpretations to the poem, but which are not necessary to our uh, understanding of the novel, The Catcher in the Rye. As Holden Caulfield is walking through the, through the streets of New York, okay, it's kind of raining, and there's a little boy walking ahead of his parents, uh, on, on the street and he's not walking on the pavement. Okay? He's walking on the side of the road. Now, if New York was anything in 1951 what it is today, you would know that, you know, it's highly dangerous for anybody to be walking not on the on the sidewalk. Uh, I'm sorry, I used the British term pavement. I'm, um, I meant sidewalk. Um, so instead of walking, you know, it would be very dangerous to use use the to uh, walk on a uh, uh, on the road instead of the sidewalk. But that's what this boy is doing. As he walks along, he's singing this song. It was, you know, put to tune and it was a song. What he's, what he's singing, nobody knows. What Holden Caulfield hears is, if a body Catch a body coming through the rye. And the line sticks in his mind. Okay? The line that he has not heard properly and therefore misunderstood completely. Okay? And his imagination supplies the rest. Right? Um, what does he what does he imagine he imagines that there are a bunch of children playing in the rye fields at the edge of a cliff remember this boy is not walking on the sidewalk he's walking on the edge of the road if he takes a couple of steps onto the road, he's likely to be uh, run over, right? So picture that in mind. Uh, picture this, this boy walking on the side of the road, not on the sidewalk where it would be safe, singing this song, Holden miss, uh, uh, mishearing it, you know, he hears it as if a body catch a body. And, and then imagining to himself a bunch of children playing in the rye fields at the edge of the cliff and in danger of falling off the cliff. Okay. And he imagines he would like to preserve the innocence of as many children as he possibly can. So he thinks of himself as a catcher in the rye who catches a child as that child is about to fall over the cliff. Okay? So 
he imagines himself as a savior of little children and a savior not so much of of the uh, uh, of of children who are in physical danger but of children who are at the in the danger uh, uh, in danger of growing up and becoming adults that is his biggest fear so what does he want to preserve he wants to preserve their childhood okay he wants to preserve and save their innocence right so there's this bunch of children Look! Look at the uh, you know the the metaphor that he's used here. There's this bunch of children, regardless of any peril to their selves, playing in a rye field. Maybe they are in great danger. One or two of them are in great danger of falling off the cliff, right? And maybe all of them are in danger of falling off the cliff. And Holden Caulfield is there to catch them standing in the rye as they fall off the cliff. Basically, from the exalted state of childhood, they fall into the depraved stage of adulthood. Got it? Can you put a thumbs up or something or put something in the chat? Because this is a very important aspect of the of the novel, right? The title, which nobody really understands. You know, the Catcher in the Rye. Oh, I read The Catcher in the Rye. Oh, I've heard of The Catcher in the Rye. And it takes a couple of readings, really, to get to, to understand what the narrator is trying to say. I should have mentioned earlier, how much time do we have left? Uh, um, 20 what? minutes. Uh, oh, we have 20 minutes. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, I tend to get carried away and, you know, <laughs> uh, go on talking. Uh, right. So um, what I should have mentioned uh, earlier was that it was not just the death of his beloved brother, that messed poor Holden up, but he practically witnessed in his messed up boarding school, okay, um, the suicide of a boy who was being badly hazed by a bunch of other boys. Right? Uh, so the ones out, they, they locked the room and they were, God knows what they were doing uh, to that boy. Okay, even, even uh, uh, Holden doesn't know, but he can hear cries. He can hear a lot of stuff that he doesn't want to tell us about. Okay, and suddenly there's a thud, commotion, and they go outside and this boy has thrown himself. Uh, out of the window. I think seeing something like that would, would really traumatize, you know, even an adult and uh, more so uh, uh, a young boy who is sensitive and vulnerable to begin with. Right? So, and he feels that the boys who hazed him, the boys who bullied him, had obviously, they were not children, right? They were, they had become adults. And he thinks only adults are capable of the kind of cruelty that those boys inflicted on this individual, right? So, um, so that that's what you know, really trauma traumatizes him and makes him think like this. So, so he feels that the only way is to is to stop children from growing up. You know, at least metaphorically, um, or, or so. All right. Now, his the brother he loved and got on so well with is dead. Right, and. 
the older brother, who he also had a lot of respect for and love for, has, in his words, you know, prostituted himself to Hollywood and is now churning out rubbish. That's what he's trying to tell us, basically. That instead of writing for himself, instead of writing about his passion, right, or about what he really wants to, he sees writing for other people and getting paid for it. So, but there is one, his parents, of course, are, uh, um, you know, they are socialites, right? And although there is evidence of their grief at uh, their son's death, but still, it's a different lifestyle, which embodies all the phoniness that Holden Caulfield again and again talks about in his book. Okay? But there is one member still in his family who's worth saving. Who is that? Phoebe, the 10-year-old sister. In any case, he stealthily finds his way into his house, goes into his sister's bedroom, makes sure she doesn't make a noise, asks her where the parents are, and she tells him that, you know, they, they've gone out and they won't be back uh, till late. And so he has this conversation with her. And she's very upset when he tells her that he's been ex uh, he's been expelled. And, and she says, you know, daddy will kill you. Daddy will kill you. She goes on repeating it and she says, don't talk to me. You've gone and done it again and he's going to kill you. Now look at this poor child. One brother has uh, grown up and gone away. One brother is dead. There's this brother she has left and who's been expelled a second time and she doesn't know what is his, his fate going to be. So enter Phoebe. As I said, she plays an important role at the end of the book. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, next day, uh, uh, in the meantime, after the incident with the teacher, when he leaves his house abruptly, not sure of the teacher's intent towards him. Uh, by the way, this was a male teacher that we are talking about. And this is 1951. So the crime, if any, is compounded. Okay. So, sorry, my iPad keeps getting locked so uh, he decides after this incident after he meets uh, after he meets his sister he, he goes away when he, he sees his uh, when he hears his parents come he goes away and uh, 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 he decides that he's not going to go home at all he's going to go away right he's just he's just going to sort of hitchhike his way across the country and he has this uh, a totally unrealistic plan of uh, finding jobs wherever he goes he's all of 16 years old and uh, uh, you know just sleeping in haystacks and uh, this very romantic idea of, you know, a, a boy running away from home and doing his own thing because he's done with education. He's done with the school system as he sees it, you know, uh, and uh, he, he's, he's done with all adults, right, um, who are evil and hypocritical. And he says, well, I'll just do my own thing. I just won't go home at all. No question of going to school, of course, but he wants to say goodbye to uh, Phoebe and he says you know well meet me um, so and so please yes opposite the history of uh, uh, the museum of natural history okay and uh, <coughs> he uh, and what does he find he finds that she's uh, once he's told her that he's going to run away. What does she find? She she what does he find that when she's walking towards him, she's lugging a suitcase with her, and he says, "What's this?" And she says, "Well, I'm coming with you." So here's the sixteen year old boy with his ten year old sister, and she says, "I'm not letting you go alone. I'm coming with you." 
okay and he says no you can't do that and uh, she says well in that case i'm going to tell our father that you've uh, you've been expelled and this and that and i'm going to get you into trouble she emotionally blackmails him he has no choice but to says okay i'm not running away okay i'm not going anywhere and can you just go back home right and uh, so but in any case they don't go back home straight away they uh, he takes her to central park and uh, the last uh, scene of the book uh, is that uh, you know little phoebe is is uh, <clears throat> going round and round on on a carousel in uh, uh, in in central park on in a merry go round and he's watching her okay so uh, that's what his kid sister is doing and then he says and it's raining all this time it's raining badly so he's already been coughing two three nights he's been spending it out in the in this in the in the rain and in all kinds of weather and uh, hasn't been eating well and uh, even has a bout of uh, uh, diarrhea so after all this he collapses and then we are told at the end that he was ill for a long time right and uh, but now he's telling his story uh, to the therapist at this rehab center and he's in the new session he'll be going to a new school so that is what the book is about okay so he feels that somehow he has succeeded in saving his little sister you know from falling over the cliff he hasn't really of course because everyone grows up right but in his mind he's is kind of convinced the readers to that that phoebe perhaps will not grow up into a phony a word that he uses again and again she will not grow up into uh, into a hypocrite right and so it ends the book is grim don't get me wrong you know it's 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 a it's it's a sad book and it's a telling commentary um, um, on 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 the social um, uh, norms of the time and how people conducted themselves and the effect that had on on youngsters but it does offer some kind of redemption at the end although mind you there are theorists who 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 say that no that when you say oh well he's going to a new school they are not sure at all that he's going to uh, you know mend his ways or turn over a new leaf or anything like that but then i personally if you ask my opinion i feel we should give the boy a chance you know and uh, i like happy endings <laughs> so we we hope that that's how how it ends he saves phoebe you know he hopes to hopes that she'll grow up into a better adult than the rest of them so holden misinterprets and thinks that he would be a catcher who would prevent children from falling into adulthood falling into adulthood is like falling into the bottomless abyss of you know when you go down a cliff it's the worst thing according to him uh, that would happen an example of uh, what he thinks is phony his uh, 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 is phoniness in adults is he says uh, he tells his readers he tells us he says every time i say to somebody i'm glad to meet you how wonderful to meet you which is what we all say to each other and he says no i'm not one bit glad to meet that person and i don't understand why i have to say it so you know these are very basic things that children do uh do say sometimes they come out with it openly also when younger children adolescents have learned to keep their mouths shut 
by the hypocrisy of and the control of adults. But sometimes little children, they are they ask you questions. But you don't even like that person, mummy. Why did you say, I'm so glad to meet you? Uh, so, you know what I mean? So it's at a very basic level, you could you could read the novel like that. And of course, had I been teaching this at this other place, at Osher, I would have expanded this class into four or five. You know, because there is always so much to discuss uh, in a book. But in one hour, it's, you know, probably all that we can we can manage. Um, okay, I have a couple of other things. So what are the themes of this novel? You know, whenever we study a book, these are some of the the main characters, the themes of the of, of a novel, uh, the plot structure, which we didn't have time for. But well, anyway, these are the things we talk about. So what are the themes of this loss of innocence, alienation, his alienation from the adult world and from society in general and from even his own uh, uh, individuals, even from his own age group. Hypocrisy, disillusionment, mortality, depression, religion. He makes a couple of quite blasphemous comments during, you know, in the course of the of, of the book. And but he comes out with something that maybe all of us ought to think of. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here as to the actual facts. But when Judas betrayed um, Jesus for 30 pieces of uh, silver, uh, I, I mean, he's supposed to go to hell. Like, you know, he's going to go to hell because he's done that, right? And Holden says, he says, I had this discussion with somebody the other day. And I said, well, but what you've told me about Jesus, wouldn't he have forgiven Judas for betraying him? Right. So then why would you, you know, those are the kind of questions he asks, questions that are uncomfortable to adults. Right. So, you know, probably they have to go back to their, their books of theology. So I'm, I'm just saying that this is one of the questions that he that he comes up with. Right. If God is all forgiving, all merciful. Then then he would then he would forgive Judas, which he probably did, of course, you know. Uh, that is what we know of the Christ figure. Okay. Why is it a banned book? Or was, or from time to time it appears on the banned books list, offensive language. I don't even have to go into details about that offensive language. It is, it's bad. Violence. There are a couple of incidents in which he gets into a brawl and he gets beaten up and it's written into graphic detail, sexual content, drug and alcohol abuse. Okay, he goes into these bars uh, uh, at uh, in uh, uh, in New York, and sometimes he's served uh, alcohol. Many times he's not. Very often he pretends uh, to, uh, you know, to be older than he is. And there are a lot of incidents like that uh, in the novel. Okay. So I did have, I did have uh, some uh, material on banned books, but it's nothing that you cannot find on the, uh, on the internet. So you can look up, you know, famous banned books and why they were banned and stuff like that. All right. I have a chat here. Um, Stephen says, I until recently thought of Catcher as a 1950s post-war, almost a mid-1960s response to rigid corporate America. But in fact, Holden Caulfield was born before World War II. Yes, if he was 16 in 1951 when the novel was written. And J.D. took the manuscript during his Normandy war experience as a soldier in counterintelligence to form and edit. Okay, well, thank you for that information, Stephen. Right. Anybody else uh, want to say anything? 
please your questions anybody want to want to uh, ask me you can you don't have to uh, get your video on but you can unmute 